So tell me a little bit about what you what you saw when you were in France in regards to alcohol levels. Of, I guess now we're talking about Syrah, but what you saw there when times were picked versus what you see here and what you do here. Well, it's a very different climate in, in northern Rome where I worked as well as Burgundy where I worked. Um, they have basically the opposite problem where our ripeness levels and the flavors and things start coming at fairly high sugar levels um, because there's actually dehydration some raisining that happens here. In Burgundy, they've got the opposite problem that's um, rarely do they get enough natural sugar to make a balanced wine um, at harvest time. Usually they have to pick because it's at the end of the growing season, the vines are starting to shut down and frankly, rot can start taking over. A lot of mildew issues come up, so they have to pick and they end up having to add um, sugar to get to certain alcohol levels. Um, <clears throat> you know, 13% would be a pretty common uh, alcohol level in a finished burgundy, but most of the time they have to add a little bit of sugar to even get that level of uh, alcohol. So it makes a different style of wine. Um, Drinkers of, of lower alcohol wines find the high alcohol levels of wines in California too high. Um, and I think rightly so, they, they can be too high. There's a burning sensation that comes along with too high of alcohol levels. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it, for me, it's prob I'm probably trying to walk the center line. Um, you know, I don't think you would make very complex wines in California at least in my particular part of California, at 12% alcohol, but you don't have to make them at 15% either. You can keep them, you know, 13.5, somewhere in there, 14%. What, uh, what's your take on the alcohol levels of Pinot, in Pinot in the Russian River Valley, and what are some of the things you may do to affect alcohol levels if you do? Well, my philosophy is to try and keep them down as much as practical. I like to have them under 14 or at least um, close to 14. Um, I feel like too much of it is just a burning sensation. Uh, the reality of why people make high alcohol wines, everybody complains about them, but uh, they make more fruit forward style of wines that uh, the wine press tends to promote people to make. So. They're kind of doing it under, you know, it wasn't really directly consumer pressure, but it becomes consumer pressure once the journalists tell them how to do it. Um, how do you affect it? You affect it mostly by when you pick the grapes because the sugar level, the riper sugar levels um, gives, converts to alcohol and gives you higher alcohol wines. The things that you can do to affect it are um, basically pick earlier if you want to keep a lower alcohol level. Natural yeast also slightly help because they um, have a slightly lower yield per per gram of uh, sugar. You get a lower um, percentage of alcohol, they're less efficient. So that's one thing. Um, open top fermenters also helps to dissipate uh, fairly minute, but it can, it can make a difference in the alcohol level. So looking around, you've got a lot of different barrels. I see just different brands and um, can you walk us through your how you select barrels for different wines? Well, basically my philosophy is that new oak barrels, when used properly, are like salt and pepper when you cook. It can enhance the natural flavors up to a point, and my um, drive is to um, find the balance point where the oak is not in the picture, in the primary flavor profile and in the background. So the way to do that is by adjusting the percentage of new barrels and the producers of barrels. So you'll probably notice my wines are a lot less oaky than typical California wines. I want the vineyard to speak in, in the forefront. Um, to a certain extent, I'm anti-new oak in that I think a lot of wines are over oaked, but at the same time, I do see that there's a value um, at, at like salt and pepper. They can enhance the, the natural flavors when used in, in the proper um, proportions. For example, the majority of the wines I make are in 20 to 25, maybe 30, yeah, 20 to 30 percent new oak. Um, the Viognier, for example, on the other hand, gets no new oak. Um, some of the 
um, more concentrated lots of pinot will be up around 35 percent new oak but it's just kind of playing with it and then when i wrap the wines i have the occasion to take it out of barrel go back to barrel and i can um, subtly adjust the percentage of new oak depending on how, how they're tasting at that point what is anthocyanin anthocyanin <laughs> Bring me back to my chemical my chemistry days. Uh, it is the color compound, um, essentially, that uh, needs to be linked with tannin to to promote uh, stable color and tannins in the wine. And it's in the grapes. Yes. Whereas it is in the skins. Yes. Do you have more or less in uh, from different parts of the vineyard? Sure, you have. Um, Anywhere you have small berries, you have um, more of it because the juice to skin ratio is much higher. In other words, um, more skins on the small berries uh, equals more anthocyanin and more stressed areas in the vineyard. All right, so what is this and what's the history of it and what's going on here? This is an antique corker that um, probably most people have retired between 10 and 20 years ago. Um, we used it up until last year for all of our production. I just keep it around for doing magnums and, you know, I guess a, as a spare of sorts. Um, the way it works is you push a bottle in one hand, I do it with my right hand, and then hits the trigger, pushes the cork in, and then I pull it with the other hand. So it's a two arm procedure, taking the bottles off of the filling machine that you don't see, putting them in here, one hand, pulling them out with the other hand. So I could do, I actually clocked it at 100 cases an hour, so about 20 bottles a minute, um, which is pretty fast. It's almost as fast as my new, um, more automated machine. How old is this? This is about as old as I am. I believe it's um, probably late 60s, early 70s. Hmm. To, make, to make organic wine, do the wood barrels have to be certified organic? Uh, no, but they all come from forests, so that you know that are sustainably farmed in terms of uh, well, they're not even farm forests; they're sustainably harvested. They just tag certain trees out in, in the forest, um, and there's no certification. But I would think they're basically organic by default. So we're, we're tasting some Pinots from 08, and we tasted the Estate, and then the Fiona. What's your, what's your process for selecting parcels? How do you, what, what are the grapes that go into your different Pinots? I have certain parts of the vineyards that I know, and they generally go based on historical knowledge of the, of the vineyards, the different parts of the vineyard that go into the different lots. But I always make exceptions if uh, one lot came out better or less characterful than, than, than I'm looking for. Um, I taste all the six to eight different lots that I start with. I taste them all repeatedly and then by the time I get done with the tasting I have a pretty good sense on, on what to do with the wines. Um, what I'm blending for is on the Fiona Hill, that one is sort of the winery flagship wine, um, the one that we're most known for and things. So I try to make a wine that's very, very unique to the vineyard site on this part of Porter Creek. Um, and then the estate is uh, parts of the vineyard that just for whatever reason don't fit in with that profile. Um, I feel like the estate is a um, very pure Russian River expression of Pinot Noir um, from maybe even this part of Russian River, whereas the Fiona Hill Vineyard Designate is a wine that comes from that particular hillside and nobody's going to make a wine that tastes just like that off of a different hillside. And then what's into the reserve? The reserve is generally coming from um, the one, t there's one extra steep terrace section um, that's probably about 40% grade and um, the reserve can be all of that one, um, such as the, the current one we're about to taste, as well as the last uh, vintage of the reserve. Um, sometimes there's, there's some other parts of the vineyard that have a unique compatibility with it. Um, the one thing I'm careful of is on the reserve is to not try to make too much. Um, 
because that would steal the heart out of the Fiona Hill. I don't want to take all the best fruit. I try and find something that's more of a different character nature, a little broader shouldered. I'm trying to get the real silky, elegant um, aspect in the Fiona Hill that I, that I just find really intriguing and, and, and sexy. And the um, reserve is kind of broader shouldered, um, more masculine, more ageability, a little more girth. Um, Different age of vines? No, it was all planted in 97. So we're all 12 year old vines. How much, uh, how much of a role does flavor play in looking at clones versus, uh, as you talked about previously, the, the question of ripening time? See, on this property, the, the vineyards were all planted. I didn't choose the clones. I just work with the vineyards I have. So I am actually a lot less of an expert on clones than, than a lot of winemakers in this area. Um, so I am not really sure how much of the flavor I get is strictly is, is clonal flavor or just straight terroir flavor. Um, I tend to, to fall more in the school of camp that believes that terroir is the, the, the more important factor. Um, not to say that uh, clonal selection has no influence, on the contrary, quite, you know, it certainly does. I mean, I've tasted clonal selections that other wineries do, and I mean, I've even seen people making bottlings of different wines that are made the same on almost the same type of soil, uh, and the only difference is the clones. So certainly the clones make a difference, um, but um, I like to focus personally on, on the soil and where it's grown and how it's grown, and then on the winemaking to make sure that it's a pure winemaking that brings out the, the differences in soil types and, and in your clone selection as well. But um, Do you find that with, uh, with age that vines tend to homogenize? If you have two different clones, if they're both 20 years old in the vineyard, do they tend to come together in terms of flavors? Or? I've got a lot of variations out here in this particular block. Um, partially due to the soil changing from one side of the block to the other um, and a bit to vine to vine. Um, I wouldn't say that I have any evidence that shows that they, the differences become less with age though. It, um, I'm just not sure. <laughs> you mentioned that, that it's a monoculture and you want to get away from that. What do you do in terms of, uh, do you plant cover crops? Do you, what do you do to treat the soil in a clearly monoculture setting? Well certainly we grow um, year-round we have cover crop on at least one out of two rows. Um, in the winter we grow a massive uh, green manure cover crop with different types of plants, a lot of legumes that add nitrogen to the soil. Um, but to get a diversity of different plant types mixed with uh, seeded and um, volunteer vegetation, it's basically a natural cover crop. Um, that. Okay. Can you just tell me exactly what is a punch down? Punch down is physically um, pushing with a small, um, like a bowl shaped device on the end of a stick, like a broomstick, pushing the grape skins into the juice. Uh, they tend to float during the fermentation because CO2, CO2 is being produced by the yeast. So the gas is taking those skins and filling them full of air and then they float and then mixing um, the skins with the juice is what gives the extraction of flavor and color. Most of the flavor and color in red wines is contained all in the skin, so it's a question of extracting as much of the good stuff out of the grape skins without extracting all of the less desirable dry tannins and bitterness and things. And you can control that by your punch down schedule versus pump overs, um, you can even control it by the size of your tanks and, very importantly, the temperature during the fermentation.